Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. We're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Light. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. We could not have asked for a more authoritative source for this morning's celebrity lecture subject. Mike Machat is a longtime official Donald Douglas, McDonnell Douglas Company artist whose work is known throughout the industry and the world. Additionally, he is a noted historian and published author who has agreed to share some of his insights and memories about this remarkable company and its founder. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Machat. Thank you for attending this morning. I am uh, honored beyond words to see so many uh, great Douglas, McDonnell Douglas and Boeing employees. I see friends, familiar faces out there. Um, I need to clarify one thing. Uh, this is being billed as the history of Douglas. If I were to properly do the history of Douglas, we'd all be here till next Thursday. So this is an overview of the great company and we'll talk about a lot of the significant airplanes and so on. Um, we're gonna have a question and answer period. I know we have a lot of veterans. We have some A4 pilots. If I get some specs wrong or a date wrong, uh, we can discuss that at the end. I would appreciate it if you uh, would just bear with me on that. But uh, there's a lot of facts and figures and we'll go ahead and get started. Before we talk about the company, I thought it would be uh, a good idea to just take a minute to show you how I wound up at this podium this morning. There's a little bit of a story to that. The year was 1956. I had just joined the service. <laughs> and I was taking flying lessons. It was a very significant year. I had just soloed in helicopters. And uh, something I loved doing more than anything else in the world was drawing airplanes. Uh, this is a Lockheed Constellation. We didn't have spell check in 1956, so sorry about that. <laughs> but uh, a very uh, pivotal event happened that summer. My father took a trip to Miami, Florida for business and came home on a brand new Douglas DC-7B Golden Falcon, Eastern Airlines. And I was very impressed. I thought this was really cool. And he brought me something from that trip. Uh, he took photos going up the boarding stair back uh, before jetways, if you remember those. And uh, he brought me a print. It was a lithograph of the airplane flying over Miami Beach, drawn by, I, I didn't know the name, it just said G period Akimoto. I was mesmerized. I was like, what is this? You saw my constellation and I, I couldn't believe that a human being had done something so beautiful. The lettering was perfect, the lines were straight. I said, Dad, what is this? My father said, well, this is a painting of the, of the airplane I flew home on, done by an artist who works for the company that builds the airplane. It's way out in California. And I remember, I was nine years old, and I remember thinking, that's his job? I have to do that. And so the story began. I wanted to work in a big factory in California. I only knew two things about California back then. I, sh I should have mentioned I was born and raised in uh, Long Island, New York. Lost my accent in the service. Um, but uh, I only knew two things about California, Disneyland and Edwards Air Force Base. Not necessarily in that order. And then all the big companies that were out there, Lockheed and North American and Douglas. And I thought, that's what I have to do. When I was 12, I wrote a letter, what else, what else do you do when you want to be an aviation artist? I wrote to Mr. Douglas, and I said, dear, dear Mr. Douglas, someday when I grow up, I want to work for your company, and I sent him a picture of a DC-8. I got this letter in return from Hugh Gagos, head of PA, Santa Monica. Uh, Mr. Douglas liked your picture so much, we're going to send you lithographs, and we certainly hope you realize your dreams when you grow up. It was a long and circuitous route. But in 1977, I hired into the presentations department and worked my way up to staff illustrator. That is my real hair. I borrowed the glasses from Eldon John. <laughs> I was privileged to work in the presentations department for the better part of eight years and then as a freelance illustrator supporting the company for another five years. I call it the greatest, greatest part of my career. It was just a dream come true. Obviously, things changed with the company. I chose to uh, leave and start my own business in 1984, but I always supported them, and uh, to this day, still have very dear friends who were from that era. So, having told you that story, I would like to launch into an overview of the great company. It all begins 
with this man right here, Donald Wills Douglas, born in Brooklyn, New York, fascinated with uh, mechanics and uh, airplanes, mechanical uh, things and air airplanes. Um, wound up as a midshipman in Annapolis at the Naval Academy, and the story goes that he was really into building model airplanes and flying them off the roof of the uh, uh, dormitory. And one Sunday morning, he was flying his models, and one of them hit the head of an admiral, and he was no longer a midshipman at Annapolis. At Annapolis. Now, whether this is true or not, I'm going with it, because I like the story. <laughs> but I've heard this many, many times. And uh, he wound up uh, graduating MIT with a degree in aeronautical engineering and working for a company back east called Glenn L. Martin. He had two other cohorts as young designers at that time. You may recognize the names, Larry Bell and Dutch Kindleberger. Both of those gentlemen went on to uh, greatness with their own companies, uh, Bell and North American. Douglas came out west and began his company uh, with the Davis Douglas Company in 1920. And the date that I use personally to launch the beginning of the Douglas Aircraft Company is July of 1921, the Douglas Company was formed. Uh, this is a movie set, movie lot on Wilshire Boulevard in Santa Monica, the first home of the company. That's a DT-2 uh, torpedo bomber there in the foreground. And here we have a picture of uh, Mr. Douglas in the cockpit with the mustache. The Cloudster was the first real airplane of the company. It was used by a San Diego, LA airline, uh, shuttling back and forth between those two cities. It was a passenger airplane, and uh, kind of significant that the first airplane Douglas built carried passengers because that's really where the name of the company uh, took hold. Douglas has had a long association with the United States Navy. This is the DT-2 torpedo bomber. And uh, of course, we have the A-4 sitting outside. This is, there's a direct lineage to uh, Douglas working with the Navy in those early years, uh, all the way up to uh, actually today with the T-45 uh, Gossok trainer. In 1924, a very significant event took place. Uh, four airplanes left Santa Monica in March of 24 to fly around the world. It had never been done. These were called the World Cruisers. Here we see them on wheels. They were also equipped with floats. Uh, one airplane was lost during the trip. It took six months, 750 flying hours, and lo and behold, three airplanes completed the trip. And that is why you see on the Douglas logo the three airplanes flying around the world. So the slogan became first around the world and Douglas became a household word, 1924. The fact that these men were able to achieve that there were Navy ships stationed along the way. Again, think about this. This is well before GPS or INS or anything. They used a compass where the demarcations on the compass were every 10 degrees, and they had lines painted on the tail for wind drift, and they got around the world navigating by dead reckoning. Think about that. And a Herculean accomplishment. Douglas Dolphin. Douglas always has a fascination with water. He had many uh, boats uh, and yachts in his day, and the seaplanes were always a big part of it. I put this photo in here just because it looks cool. This is the Catalina steamer in the background, uh, and the, the dolphin at the pier at San Pedro. Just one of the neat photos from uh, that time period, 1933 or so. That same year, the DC-2 took a flight, a very significant airliner, during the Depression. This young lady here, Shirley Temple, captivated the country with her uh, acting and, and singing skills in a movie called Bright Eyes, featuring a Douglas DC-2. This is the good ship Lollipop, if you remember that song. And uh, suddenly, Douglas was becoming well-known in the field. Here's the great man with his new Buick at Santa Monica. That's a DC-3 in the hangar. And this is where things really take off, no pun intended. By World War II, Douglas was producing a variety of different airplanes. We have here a montage. Let's start at the bottom. The uh, B-23 Dragon, A-26 Invader, uh, going uh, clockwise, C-47 Skytrain, C-54 Skymaster, Douglas B-18 Bolo, upper right-hand corner, the Dauntless, remember the Battle of Midway? The B-19, the World Bomber, the largest airplane in the world at that time, and in the lower right-hand corner, the B-17 Flying Fortress. Now, wait a minute. This is a talk about Douglas. What's a Boeing airplane doing in a Douglas talk? Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is the crux of the great man, Donald Wills Douglas. One of his best friends was a guy named Bill Boeing. During, the world, uh, during World War II, the war effort uh, needed ramping up of American industrial strength, and uh, Boeing and Douglas got together, and Douglas said, I'm going to build a plant 
in Long Beach, and we are going to build B-17s under license. And that became the beginning of Douglas Long Beach. Surprises a lot of people. When I first hired in, a lot of the older hands always called it the bomber factory. Never understood that. Well, we were building DC-10s. Bomber factory, B-17, Long Beach, California. The plant was built in 1941. The DC-3, first airplane to make a profit carrying passengers. A little bit of trivia, I don't know, a lot of people realize that the wing of the DC-3 was designed by an engineer named Jack Northrup. Anybody heard of him? <laughs> Uh, he was working with Douglas, uh, in association with the Douglas Company, working for Douglas, up until 1939 when he left the company to start his own operation, which uh, went on to greatness in its own way. But the point I want to make here is that an airliner became a transport during World War II, the famed C-47, which uh, General Eisenhower considered one of the five great machines that helped America win the war. And then we have the C-54, which went the other way. Uh, a, a transport used during the Berlin airlift, uh, bringing in nearly half a million tons of coal and food uh, during that uh, situation in 1948. And the C-54 went on to become the DC-4 airliner. I've always got a question, was there ever a DC-5? Why, yes, there was. They built 12 of them. It did not go into production because of the war effort, but it's very significant, and why? It was a high-wing, twin-engine airplane this particular airplane was nicknamed Rover, and it was owned by Douglas's good friend, Bill Boeing. Can you imagine today Boeing buying a Douglas aircraft as, uh, for private uh, transportation? But this is uh, one of 12 built. Uh, also significant, there was one airline that used them, and that was KLM. And that gives KLM the distinction of flying every Douglas production airplane from the DC-2 to the MD-11 all the way to the end. One airline flew them all, KLM. DC-6, we call this the thoroughbred, powered by four Pratt & Whitney R2800 engines. This is the airplane that put long-range air travel on the map. Pressurized, uh, about a 300 mile an hour cruise speed, coast to coast, with one stop across the US, first international flights. But the DC-6 created passenger travel. When I talk to school groups, I always ask how many people flew in an airplane today, and most all the kids' hands go up. And I say, do you realize if I asked the same question in 1948, when this airplane was brand new, out of 100 people, three hands would go up. Only 3% of the American population had flown, and this is the airplane that changed that. DC-7, here we see the seven seas, which was a play on word for the seven continents. Uh, the first true intercontinental airliner, 355 mile an hour top speed. And this brought air travel up to the jet age. This uh, airplane flew in uh, the 55, 57, 58 time period. And this was the queen of the skies at that time. Now, parked outside, we have the A4 Skyhawk, and I'd like to talk a little about that. What you see on the screen is a, <laughs> he used to call them sketches, I call it genius. This is an R.G. Smith drawing, uh, which was created for the rollout of the very last Skyhawk in February 1979. But uh, this is where R.G. and I came into the picture together. I was the, uh, the new kid assigned to work uh, in the presentations department supporting his office. And this was our first project together. This is the rollout of the last airplane. They made gold foil etchings. This was the uh, sketch that RG made showing the A4M, the TA4J two-seater, and the prototype XA4D in the background. Uh, that started a long association. Uh, RG was a lifelong friend, and I was deeply honored to have worked with him and for him. This is the uh, same model that's parked outside, A4D1. And let's talk a little of why the airplane looks the way it does. It's basically an engine with wings and a cockpit. Uh, powered originally by a Wright J65, about 8,200 uh, pounds of thrust. You look at the size of the engine relative to the airplane, and here's the fun fact of the A4. The wingspan is 26 feet 6 inches. That's the wingspan. The wing area on an A4 is less than the same area of the tail of an F-14 Tomcat. Think about that. But that wingspan is significant. Why is it 26 feet 6 inches? Ed Heinemann was determined to build an airplane to meet a Navy requirement that two of them could be towed past each other on the hangar deck of an Essex-class carrier without the wings having to be folded. And that distance was 26 feet, 6 inches, the wingspan of the A4. This is the cutaway of the A4 where we talked about the uh, structure. Look at the size of the cockpit, the engine, and the wings. And that's where the name Scooter came from. The man behind it, Ed Heinemann, pictured with his great airplane on the ramp, 
Ed was uh, originally hired by Northrop and stayed with Douglas in the split in 1939, as did R.G. Smith. And uh, here is a picture of Ed at the rollout of the last airplane. We tried to make 3,000 and uh, we built 2,960. But the last airplane rolled out in February was painted in the uh, colors of all the countries that used it. Uh, this airplane eventually went to the Marines as an A4M. Let's look at some of the other airplanes that Ed Heinemann was responsible for. The Sky Raider, A4D, AD, two seat and, uh, and single seat. Sky Raider was used in uh, Korea and Vietnam. Technically the first supersonic airplane Douglas built, although in, uh, in a dive, but the F4D Sky Ray, the bat wing uh, carrier uh, air defense uh, fighter. The A3D Sky Warrior, referred to as the Whale. And just for definitive purposes, this is the largest, heaviest airplane that operated off aircraft carriers. We get a lot of uh, RA-5 guys and uh, F-14 guys that talk about gross weights and whatever, but this A3D was the largest, heaviest operational carrier-based airplane. Anybody know what the largest airplane ever to fly off an aircraft carrier was one time in a series of tests? C-130. Very good. I should know with this crowd. Absolutely. The Crimson Test Tube, the uh, D558-1 Sky Streak, another Heinemann design. That's Gene May, Douglas test pilot, and uh, Marine pilot uh, Marion Carl on the lake bed at Edwards with the Sky Streak. Following on with the D558-2 Sky Rocket. Three were built. One is in Antelope Valley at the college up there. Uh, one is at Chino, and the third one, which is this airplane being uh, air launched with a rocket, is at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Why? It's the first airplane to fly Mach 2. NACA test pilot Scott Crossfield on uh, 20 November 1953 took this airplane to its absolute limit and reached twice the speed of sound. Another significant name and one of my personal favorites, I only wish I'd gotten to meet him, uh, Bill Bridgman, who uh, put Douglas on the map as one of the few contractor test pilots, a civilian test pilot, setting world records in a company airplane. That's not even possible today. But uh, he took the Skyrocket and of course the X3 uh, into the history books uh, and was a great, great man. Douglas X-3, through no fault of its own, what I call the best looking, worst flying X-plane of all time. It never had the engines it was designed for, it made 59 flights total, the only one was built and it survived, it's currently at the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, uh, an amazing looking airplane. And uh, I always try to talk about the bright side, it did not live up to its design uh, potential, but it is the first airplane ever to have an air-conditioned cockpit. <laughs> so I always have to go with the positive. Douglas C-133 Cargo Master, which was an evolution of the uh, Globemaster series. Uh, turboprop powered, seen here at Long Beach. And uh, if you look at the fuselage, can you imagine what cargo this might have carried? This was designed to carry ICBM missiles coast to coast into the different bases, the 133 Cargo Master at Long Beach. Now this is where the story changes. The DC-8 came about in the mid-50s. First flight was 1958, May 30th. And Santa Monica, where all the prop airliners had been built, no longer had a runway sufficient for jets. The whole operation was moved to Long Beach. In the background, you see the 133, uh, the 124, a little bit too small on the screen to see, but the B-66, and uh, there's even a C-47 parked there on the ramp. I always get a kick out of showing this to the kids, the school groups that I talk to, because they think the airplane's on fire. <laughs> and I say, true or false, jet airliners always took off in full afterburner. And the answer is no. That smoke is a uh, product of water injection, where they would inject uh, distilled water into the burner sections of the J-57 engines, and it produced smoke, but it was extra thrust on takeoff before fan jets came of age. That's a United DC-8 taking off out of Long Beach. One of my favorite all-time stories, and I'm going to share it with you today. Back in this era, Douglas was personal friends with just about every airline president, Juan Tripp, Pat Patterson. And here we have Eddie Rickenbacker, the World War I ace, who was heading up Eastern Airlines. The famous story is that uh, Boeing had the uh, Dash 80 prototype of the 707 already flying, and Douglas DC-8 was still on the drawing board, and it was very frustrating for the company. And Rickenbacker called up Douglas in Santa Monica and says, Doug, Boeing just guaranteed the uh, SFC, specific fuel consumption, on uh, the J-57 on their 707. Can you do the same on the DC-8? And Doug said, no, Eddie, I, I'm not going to give you any numbers until we flight test the airplane. And Rickenbacker said, good, you just sold 25 DC-8s. And that just goes to the heart of the integrity of Donald Douglas and the way business was conducted back then. Uh, it was literally a phone call, and multi-million dollar jet order happens right over the phone. This is my all-time favorite color scheme. I told you about my dad's trip on the Eastern DC-7, so I've always had a connection. 
this is the Golden Falcon scheme designed by the world-renowned uh, industrial designer Raymond Lowy. The reason I'm sharing this with you is that in a period of 18 months, this design went through nine different changes. So I call that Machat's Law. No two airplanes are ever painted exactly the same. But it was honest to gosh metallic gold paint used in that cheat stripe, which was a maintenance nightmare, but just goes to the heart of how airplanes were designed and painted back in the, in the beginning of the jet age. Very significant airplane the, out of Long Beach, the DC-9. This is ship one prototype. And uh, the DC-9 design evolved over many, many years, winding up with the, I still call it a Super 80. I don't use the MD-80 term too often, uh, the Mad Dog. But this is the DC-9 Super 80. My favorite airplane of all the, all the projects I worked on at the company because it's the only machine that I ever got to experience from the announcement by John Brizendine, our president at the time, launching the program, doing the paintings and illustrations for it, and then getting to fly on the airplane about three years later. So it was a great thrill to see this from literally the first piece of metal cut, and then my wife and I made a special trip on a weekend on PSA to go to San Francisco just to fly on my airplane. Douglas also built missiles. This is the Nike Hercules. And this is an amazing story. There are a lot of sites around California. If you drive around and you see uh, Army and Navy armories on the corner in the middle of a neighborhood and you wonder why that's there, those are former Nike bases. Uh, LAX had a huge complex, 24 launchers, uh, at an area north uh, on uh, Pershing uh, Drive. Uh, some of the buildings are still there today. The operation is called Jet Pets. It's a, a processing center for racehorses and circus animals. But some of those original buildings from that Nike site are still there on Pershing Drive, right at the end of the runway. And uh, anybody want to take a guess how many Nike missiles were produced in Huntington Beach? 25,000. And they were the first line of defense uh, on surface air during the Cold War from 1955 through 1974. We had one in our neighborhood, nobody even knew it. 14 nuclear warheads underneath, and it was next to a school, rec center. But the Nike sites were peppered all across the country, and uh, God bless them, it was run by the Army. They were uh, literally the first line of defense during the Cold War, if anything had happened. Another very significant machine built in Huntington Beach, the Thor missile, flying today, much more modern iteration as the Delta. Think of an airline that, uh, I'm sorry, an airplane company that built passenger planes, jet fighters, bombers, cargo airplanes, missiles, all in one operation. Rare, uh, at that time it was uh, Lockheed and Convair also built all those different kinds of airplanes. Just an amazing time in aerospace history. April of 1967, the company became McDonnell Douglas. Here's what Long Beach looked like at that time. You remember that G period Akimoto on that litho that my dad gave me? Well, that was George Akimoto, the chief illustrator. I got to meet him and work with him in the presentations department, and he was uh, uh, an amazing talent. Here is a DC-10 uh, going through Cat 3, you know, all-weather landing testing. He painted in acrylic and was just a marvel. I learned so much from him. He was a wonderful, wonderful artist. Here's his rendition of my favorite airplane, the Super 80. And here's my cutaway of the airplane, done well before the thing ever flew, this was to show customers what it was like. Now you notice the cabin, 165 seats. Why do I know that? Because I had to repaint the upholstery. 165 seats. But uh, you notice that the cabin is divided uh, in blue and gold section, and I got that idea from my dad's DC-7. That's the way Eastern painted the airplane. They alternated every, every three or four rows was gold and blue. I said, I'm going to use that. So you see how it's all connected. Uh, this was the first piece of art that uh, uh, I ever won an award. This was best of category in the uh, Illustration West uh, competition in 1981. And so uh, this is the piece that allowed me to say award-winning aviation artist. Um, painting in, in water-based gouache. This is, I'd just like to share with you some of the uh, projects that we did there in presentations. This is a KC-10 refueling a F-15 Strike Eagle. Looks plausible, there was just one little catch. Neither of these airplanes had flown when this painting was done. The purpose of what we did in presentations was to convey to the customer, in this case the United States Air Force, the products that we make. A Long Beach built KC-10, a St. Louis built Strike Eagle, and uh, RG was my, uh, uh, gave me a nice uh, critique on the painting. Uh, but this is what we did there in presentations. Another aspect, uh, you're, you're seeing finished art. This is how it begins, these are the comps. And I always love this story because at 10.30 in the morning, uh, my boss, Hank Montez, called me down to his office. He says, I got a project for you. They need an illustration comp, which is a sketch, 
uh, by one o'clock for a staff meeting. So I knew two things. Number one, I wasn't going to eat lunch. And number two, I wasn't going to use oil paint. This, believe it or not, is colored pencil. And uh, the headline was done by the graphics. And so this was a brochure mock-up for the DC-10 stretch, which became, guess what, the MD-11. But this was done in 1979. That's the finish. So you can see the difference from going from the sketch, the rough sketch, the engineers. Uh, I was always very, very proud of the fact that presentations was part of the engineering department. And we worked very closely. Guys would come down with blueprints and say, hold it, don't finish that painting. We just changed the aileron hinge. You know, the flap track fairing is two inches longer. Don't, no, hold on. And so we would, we would work directly with the engineers. And uh, we, we spoke airplane in a very, uh, very loving way. This is kind of neat. Anybody familiar with the Russian uh, Wiggy Caspian Sea Monster? The wing and ground effect vehicle. Does this look somewhat similar? <laughs> Strategic Air Command markings launching a Tomahawk. Right. But it was a job ticket. It was a project, and I had to do it, and so there we went. I always say it, uh, it needed more engines, but they didn't listen to me. <laughs> so this was done in about 1981-82 time frame. Um, just recently, I was dragged kicking and screaming into the world of uh, Instagram by my older daughter. So I now have an Instagram site, and I decided, this is long declassified, long since declassified. So I decided to post this on my Instagram page. Uh, it went viral. I had 460 likes in the first hour or something. It went berserk. And guess where most of the comments came from? Russia. <laughs> this is a true story. I get one comment in Cyrillic. I have to go to Google Translate to find out what it's saying. And the comment from a Russian guy in uh, St. Petersburg was as follows. I translated it from Russian. It said, you have picture, we have real one. <laughs> True story. OK, back to the A4. Uh, one of my favorite all-time projects was this brochure cover for the 1981 team brochure celebrating the 35th anniversary of the team. Now, why is this interesting? Well. I'm sitting in my office, I just had the job ticket, and I'm thinking, how, how do we show, they wanted to show the first airplane, the Hellcat, and the newest airplane, the A4, together, flying over the emblem of the Blue Angels. And I was sitting there wondering how I could do this, get a knock on the door of my office, and I turn around, it's Harry Gann, company historian, and he says, Mike, I understand you just got to sign the, the Blue Angels cover. Yes, Harry. He says, you can't paint it until you fly in the airplane. This is an assignment for my job. Are you kidding me? This is B at El Centro at uh, 3 o'clock on Friday. Uh, check in with Dale, Dale Specht, our tech rep down there, and uh, you're going to be flying with the team. Right. We went out to the practice area. This is uh, Randy Clark in the solo airplane, sitting there at center point in the middle of the desert, watching the team actually fly the show. It was an incredible experience. We were so proud to support the team flying the A4F. Let me talk a little about this airplane. This is a much more powerful uh, machine than uh, the original, as you see outside. Uh, Pratt & Whitney J52, 11,200 pounds of thrust. With all the tactical systems removed from the airplane, the, the thrust to weight ratio was approaching one to one. So that's what gave this the air show performance that it had. Um, and gosh, the pilots love flying these airplanes. Uh, Harry told me an interesting fact that when the team was photographed, the only photos ever allowed to be released were when the formation was perfect. So if an airplane was just slightly out of alignment or whatever, you never saw those photos in the brochures. Look at the trailing edges of the wing airplanes, two and, f two and uh, three. Uh, it's perfection. Separation at the tips, about 36 inches, uh, and they're doing four to 500 miles an hour flying aerobatics. Right. Uh, I was fortunate to fly in this airplane uh, with Randy Clark, who that year actually was narrator. Uh, this is uh, number seven, Blue Angels number seven, TA-4J. One of uh, Randy's favorite maneuvers was to uh, hit the gear switch on the roll. Uh, the gear retracts forward, so once the weight comes off the oleos and the squat switch senses the airplanes in the air, gear snaps up, and you're sitting there at 14 feet radar altitude, which I watched on the panel, uh, all the way to the end of the runway where he goes uh, into a 6G pull, and then you wind up at the top looking something like that. And the question I always get is, do they really fly that close together? Uh, yeah. Uh, this is coming down the backside of a loop, and I remember looking at that barn that you see right next to the uh, center post there, and I said, wow, Randy, this is really cool. And he goes, well, yeah, but we're normally not up this high when we do these maneuvers. You've seen those posters in uh, the gift shops that say success and perseverance, and you know, uh, you know, they have a photo with some term off it. This is called trust. The slot and the wing airplanes and the solo airplanes land in reverse order with the lead touching down last in formation, crossing the runway at about 120 miles an hour. 
Good trick. And they make it look easy. So this is what the Blue Angels is all about. At that same time period, the YC-15 had just won a fly-off competition against Boeing's twin-engine YC-14 for the AMST, the uh, medium-range uh, cargo transport. Uh, you see the flaps in the extended position. This is a shot taken on the ramp at Edwards. And uh, we're going to talk about why that was so significant. It was an amazing airplane. A quick story about the people at Douglas. Uh, Marvin Marks was the program manager. I was working on night shift. I was the new kid. We were working on this proposal. Uh, night shift normally, normally doesn't meet program managers, right? We're punching a time clock. We're making tech art. When this airplane won that competition, Marvin came to our department, walked around, shook everyone's hand, and gave everyone a YC-15 TITAC. That's the spirit of this company. We were family. He was acknowledging all the people that helped him win his proposal. And I will never forget that as long as I live. That's what Douglas was all about. It was about people. The last military airplane uh, from Long Beach is the T-45. This is the last project that I worked on. The Goshawk, still flying today as the primary jet qualifying airplane for carrier pilots in the U.S. Navy. Production was moved to St. Louis uh, in the Boeing era, but uh, this was the last military airplane from Long Beach. And the C-17 is the last military airplane built at Long Beach. Total of 279 C-17 Globemaster III's were produced. Ladies and gentlemen, bittersweet to share this with you, but think about this. This airplane was the last manned, fixed-winged aircraft produced in the state of California. We have Northrop Grumman with their amazing unmanned aircraft. And right down the row here, we have Robinson Helicopter, rotary wing. But the last fixed-wing manned production aircraft in the state of California was the C-17 Globemaster III. I'd like to close with a little bit about the Douglas sign, uh, which is currently in Long Beach, but how many of you know that it began in El Segundo? This is the original iteration of the, the Fly Douglas sign with, uh, oh gosh, an A-4. The Around the World three airplanes theme is still there with the uh, uh, DC-7, DC-8 type uh, stylized airplanes. And then when it was moved to Long Beach, uh, it was uh, modified into the McDonnell Douglas logo with the uh, SST and the rocket. And this was the sign from the mid-60s all the way to 1980. In 1980, those same letters were manipulated into Fly DC jets. And uh, you notice the JAL DC-1040 out there is minus its tail. Why is that? Final building 84, the, the top of that tail there cleared the, the uh, bottom of the door by a, a couple of feet. And then the uh, vertical stabilizers were added by crane outside on the ramp. I always enjoyed watching that. This was the plant during the heyday in 1972. DC-10's on the production line. Just two weeks ago, I flew in a helicopter uh, with the LA County Sheriff and launched to the north out of Long Beach. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the same scene today. Douglas Business Park. Um, if you notice, to the left of the uh, image is a traffic circle, and uh, in the middle of that traffic circle is a pylon with a globe and three biplanes. It's a replica of the original globe and world cruisers that sat atop the company headquarters on Ocean Park Boulevard in Santa Monica for many, many years. Uh, the streets in the Douglas Business Park are named for the Douglas executives. So there's Heinemann Highway and uh, Warsham Way and... Uh, uh, many other uh, company execs that are memorialized, but those final assembly buildings that you see at the top are currently leased by Mercedes-Benz, and that is the West Coast Processing Center for the automobiles coming in uh, to the ports of Long Beach and LA. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'll be glad to take some questions. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. The question was, where was the Douglas Presentations Department? We were in Building 2, uh, up in the corner, they call it the attic. Uh, you'd come in through uh, Building 35, the engineering building, uh, with all the glorious R.G. Smith paintings in the lobby and everything, and then you'd go all the way to the back, go up a few more steps, and you were in one of the original factory buildings. Uh, the department, when I hired in, was 152 people. And uh, let me spend, a thank you, that's a great question, thank you. Let me, let me spend a minute on that. It was like being in Disneyland. 
We had a silkscreen group making displays for the Farnborough Air Show and, and the Paris Air Show and, and all these incredible uh, displays with the huge tables with the big photos and all this stuff. We had an airbrush group doing the airline markings. We had an editorial group doing all the brochures. We had graphic design. We had staff illustrators. Uh, we had the tech art group, which was incredible. The, the, uh, back in the day before digital illustration, they, they were inking drawings by hand. And to me, it was fine art, watching these, these artisans work. It was incredible. So there was all these different disciplines, uh, and the common thread is we all loved airplanes. We were all a bunch of airplane geeks, and we couldn't, couldn't wait to get to work every morning. It was just an amazing place. How did the culture change when McDonald bought Douglas? What time do we close? <laughs> um, listen, I, I, have to be, I have to be objective here. Um, aerospace was going through wrenching changes uh, during the Vietnam War. Uh, the consolidation, which now led us to one company building airliners out of five. I mean, think about that. At the end of World War II, you had Martin, Lockheed, Douglas, uh, Boeing, uh, and Convair, all building airliners at, in the late 1940s. And today, you've got one company. Um, there was a major shift. The St. Louis mentality, they built Navy jets. We built airliners. Um, I, I have to, you know, th there, were, there were times when it was, uh, it was challenging. But uh, let me answer that question on an up note. Anybody here familiar with the Boeing 787 Dreamliner? It's Boeing's new airplane, it's composite, it's a magnificent machine. Uh, it gives me great joy to tell you that many of the lead engineers on that airplane came from Long Beach. And that airplane is considered by the people in the airline industry as the first McDonnell Douglas Boeing airliner. So God bless them up there. DC-10 accidents. Sometimes in history, things uh, pile up in a way that is uh, very, very unfortunate. Uh, there were three DC-10s lost in a five-month period in 1979. It was a turning point for the company. Uh, the first one was an American Airlines accident in Chicago uh, with a, a mechanical issue with the airplane. Uh, I won't go into detail here, but it was a, a, a design question with the airplane. The second and third DC-10s were lost by human error. But the fact that the name of the airplane was in the news I remember waking up uh, to both the, the second and third accident to my uh, clock radio in the morning, and another DC-10 had gone down. And it tarnished the reputation of the airplane, but uh, I have to tell you, 500-plus uh, were built. The Air Force is flying 59 KC-10s. They've never had a problem with them. Uh, it was just an unfortunate, very, very tragic happenstance with three accidents in a very concentrated time. What was the impression on the employees? We were walking around with buttons on our lapel saying, we're proud of the DC-10. Uh, and I don't mean to make light of the tragedy, certainly, but uh, uh, we understood the mechanics of what was happening. Uh, I'm not going to get into how media takes these kinds of stories and runs with it. That's not uh, appropriate for right now. But um, uh, we were under attack. Uh, I remember coming in the Monday after the Chicago accident, and there were news helicopters flying around. The hangar doors were closed. Uh, it, was, it was like being under siege. And um, again, I want to keep this appropriate for the, for the group, but uh, it was a tough time for the company and we gave it our all. I was the last person hired by Doug McGregor, who was the first person enacted to start an art department at Santa Monica. I thought that was pretty cool. And he said, uh, Mike, uh, we'd love to have you aboard. I have some good news and bad news. Good news is you got the job. Bad news, you're starting on night shift. And I went, yes! <laughs> this was the greatest training ground. Thank you so much for the question, this is wonderful. It was the greatest training ground I could have asked for. Could you take these uh, blueprints down to Litho? Could you take these drawings down to the print shop? Could you go up here to the engineering office? Could you talk? I learned the ropes from the bottom. Uh, we worked from uh, 442 to 112 was our shift. And as the new kid, I had to go get dinner. And it was like, they're paying me to do this? I can't believe it. Uh, wonderful, wonderful people. Howard Drury was our foreman. And what was the purpose of night shift? The purpose of night shift was to get all the work done for the salesmen that were leaving on uh, proposal trips around the world. And so day shift would take the job to a certain point. Uh, there were times when uh, night shift guys would literally get in a car and drive to LAX to hand a box of proposal brochures to a salesman getting on the, on the Pan Am or TWA plane going to Cairo, wherever he was going. Um, we worked under a very, very tight deadline. It was the training group. It was kind of like boot camp. It was kind of like basic training. And uh, I loved every second of it. It was fantastic. First company to make an aircraft of metal skin. We get into aviation trivia here. Technically, the first metal airliner was the Junkers F-13. 
so you know the Cloudster was was fabric and wood. Um, you get into a lot of you know what exact date might have happened, but the first all metal low wing twin engine airliner DC one prototype uh, was was a significant machine, uh, and that was 1933. Uh, the Ford tri motor was was all metal in 1929. So. Uh, a little bit, a little bit tricky. But question was, could I uh, share some thoughts on being an illustrator back in those days compared to the people I know in the industry today? Is that it? Yeah. Uh, there's one key word to, to explain the difference between what I did and what's happening today. The word is digital. Uh, and and I don't mean to make light of it. Um, think about this. I was making manual. Gosh, we were making view graphs and flow charts and inking drawings and painting paintings. Um, when airplanes were flown with uh, round gauges with needles that move to a number. And uh, that's the way it was in that time period. Now you've got uh, digitally generated design. The airplanes are flown digitally. It makes total sense to have digital illustration because guess what? When a change is made to the design of the airplane, it's one move and the brochures change, the procedures change, the artwork changes, everything changes because it's digital. So. What I'm alluding to here is I accept the fact that the world has changed. But when I went to art school, way, way back in the 60s, I went to uh, Pratt Institute in New York to become an artist. That's what we were going to do. I was going to become an artist. Today, I'm a natural media artist. We squeeze gooey stuff out of tubes and we spread it on a piece of canvas with a brush. And it's this ar archaic Stone Age technology. But we make our art using traditional methods. The digital artists today, let's talk about that. Presentations was 165 people. Digital art group today is about 10, because that's all you need. So progress hurts to say, you know, th those days are gone. Uh, I was just so uh, privileged to be a part of it, but it was a definitely a different time. I always say that saying, you know, the term paste up artist, which was a production artist back in those days, you might as well be saying lamp lighter, you know, <laughs> coal shoveler on a railroad. I mean, it's that, it's that far back, so. The question was talk about video services and this kind of, if I can expand, uh, we were one cog in a big wheel. We worked with uh, the photo department. I remember Jim Klein, uh, a lot of great people who, whose job was to do whatever had to be done together as a team. Uh, I remember one time uh, I got a call from the Goodyear uh, uh, rubber company in Akron, Ohio. They were gonna make a mural in their lobby of a KC-10 uh, landing on Goodyear tires, and we had to get a shot on runway 30 as a KC-10 was coming back from a flight test at the exact second that the tires hit the runway and created all the smoke. And they were going to make a, a billboard or a, a mural size illustration from that. So I called Jim, and he got his team out there. We, we coordinated with uh, the airport, and it took, it was a dance of maybe eight or ten people to coordinate it and get a team out there, and they shot it. And lo and behold, we got this beautiful photo of, you remember the KC-10 had the center landing gear? So you had the two outboards, and, and it was just hitting the runway, all this smoke and action, and, and it was, you know, flaps were down. It was just incredible. And uh, about a week later, I get a call from the rep I was working with, and he said, Mike, oh my God, that's so much better. Than, is there anything we can do to say thanks for that great effort that you made? And I said, yeah, I've never been up in the blimp. <laughs> so I took... Took Sherry and uh, we went down there to, uh, to uh, off the Harbor Freeway and, and flew in the blimp as a thank you. But uh, just a, an example of how all the different departments, Litho and, and Photo and all the different members worked as a, as a team. I'm going to turn the mic over to Cindy and let her uh, take the program from here. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for allowing me to share this. Don't go anywhere because right now, if you have some questions for the two A4 pilots, Doug and Rich, would you like to come up here? Yes, so how easy is it to bring aboard a ship? Very easy. <laughs> as far as airplanes go, everybody loves bringing this airplane aboard the ship. It was built to land on carriers, uh, as, my, as uh, he said. I can further respond to that. Uh, I, didn't, I went through Air Force pilot training at the time, and in, back in the Marine Corps, and before I knew it, I was assigned to a squadron that was going aboard ship. And now in the Navy program, they get uh, each one of the, the uh, trainers that they work with, they actually go out and get some ship time. I'd never even seen one of these boats. And so uh, they said, don't worry, we'll work you up with the squadron. Uh, he says it's easy. I'll say it's after you practice so much, there is 
you're ready to go. At daytime, it's straightforward and easy. Nighttime, I don't buy it. <laughs> Especially in uh, zero conditions. <laughs> you, you have no uh, boat or place to go. You gotta get back on the ship. You don't have any other choices. So uh, yeah, in the fog at night, it's a little tricky. But uh, the A4 is also uh, known to be a tanker on the carriers. Mm -hmm. So if uh, somebody got down to their last chance, fuel-wise, then uh, you'd have to go up and find the tanker and get some more gas uh, so you'd have a few more shots at it. But uh, anyway, I, I, needless to say, I love flying the plane. I've flown all the models, the A4A, B, C, D for Douglas, E, F, TA4, about 2,000 hours. What's maintenance like? I uh, was an aircraft maintenance officer, also as a collateral duty. And I'll say this, it was a pretty straightforward airplane. Uh, you only had to split the fuselage if you were going to pull the engine. Uh, that was, uh, or during the uh, uh, annual inspections, if you will. The rest of the time, uh, it was, it's a straightforward airplane. Uh, and I like to compare it when uh, I got out of pilot training, everybody wanted to fly the F-4 Phantom. And I, ended, I got orders for the A-4, didn't even know what it was, it, that's another story. But uh, turns out, uh, when I especially got into maintenance, our man hours, maintenance man hours per flight hour was half of what the maintenance of time for with the F-4. So it's, we got more flight time, straightforward airplane, not a lot of systems. It's a fantastically straightforward, simple airplane to maintain. These uh, A4 Alphas, the first model, came out in about 1954. And uh, so that's what we had at uh, Los Alamitos Naval Air Station, uh, the, the A's and the B's. And so I guess I did fly this particular airplane uh, back in uh, about 1967. Ditch a plane, is that what she said? Okay. Uh, I was flying the F-11 Tiger uh, Grumman supersonic jet and uh, advanced flight training in Texas. And they were an older model. The Blue Angels flew it, but uh, it was getting a little old and I had a, a disabled airplane at about 40,000 feet, so I was trying to restart it on the way down. <laughs> Didn't work, 10,000 feet, you better pull the curtain. So I did that and uh, it got out okay. Uh, had got drugged by the chute a little bit, but uh, I was back flying in about a month. Uh, the airplane landed, nobody got hurt. Um, and that was my experience joining the uh, Caterpillar Club. <laughs> I uh, had none. My uh, number of landings equal the number of takeoffs, fortunately. <laughs> I think there are some A4s. In fact, I think, uh, is the airplane still flying? Uh, yeah, 64 years later, it's still flying. I think there's even a couple owned by individual people who have bought it and fixed it up and they're flying air shows. Uh, I know the Brazilian Air Force, I think, is, or Navy Air Force is still flying it. Of course, the many, many countries flew the A-4 over the years. There actually is a company down in Florida that has a fleet of, a, I think, probably about 10 of them still flying. They, he, they got them from the Israelis. And they use them, the military hires them on contract to use them as uh, uh, simulated missile attacks or, or even dogfighting. Uh, you take this airplane, uh, take all the armament off of it, and put the latest engine in it, and it will turn uh, just like a, well, I think Roy would tell you, like it's close to a, like a MiG. Uh, it can really turn, so they still use them in some of the uh, air combat maneuvering mm -hmm. training. So, but there are, I think, roughly around 10 of them flying for that company, and I think there's about four of them flying that are privately owned. How effective as a fighter? Well, the A-4 was the primary uh, attack bomber in the Vietnam War, as you probably know. Uh, about 350 
lost in that war. Um, on my ship, the USS Ranger, I think we set all kinds of records uh, in combat, but it, you know, normally it's not used as a fighter. Some of the other countries have it as their primary fighter. Uh, Israelis used it as a fighter and a bomber. In fact, I think they, they flew it for about 40 years, up until just a couple years ago. I flew the uh, A-4 in combat in Vietnam. Uh, it was, uh, I read somewhere later that the A-4 was considered the most cost-effective uh, weapons delivery system in the Vietnam theater. What was a typical bomb uh, load for, was it a troops in contact? Okay, off, off a of carry, I'll take the question. Okay, it weighs about 10,000 pounds and it can carry its own weight in ordnance, which is amazing. Yeah. So I think the max takeoff weight was around 24,000 pounds yeah. in order to make sure that you're still flying at the end of the bow. In Vietnam, we used uh, our standard load was uh, eight. Uh, yeah, eight 500-pound bombs, each airplane, we always went out in a flight of two. And that was kind of a standard one that we would use, and that was what the forward air controller and the grunts liked the best. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.